Greetings, greenhouse people, specifically all the perennial people out there, and welcome to another edition of Ball's Tech on Demand video education, where we talk to experts about specific, timely, and relevant topics. This time, we're going to focus on lavender, a popular crop these days and one with a lot of action on the breeding side. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and I'm joined by Chris Fifo, a product representative with Darwin Perennials, and Keith Seed, who's going to coming to us live on video from Chicago land. How's it going out there, Chris? Hey, Bill, how you doing? It's going well here. Nice to be here. Awesome, awesome. I think it's been hot this week, so uh, I'm sure that uh, all the uh, growers out there are dealing with some, some hot conditions, but uh, hopefully getting through it as we head into uh, fall before we know it. So Chris works with a lot of key young plant producers and accounts throughout North America, bringing perennial knowledge to solve problems and optimize their perennial production. He's got extensive perennial technical and product knowledge, and it's rooted in a practical greenhouse experience from a 30-year career working as technical advisor and head grower at Swift Greenhouses in Gilman, Iowa. So Chris, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, and tell us a little bit about your time at Swift and maybe some of the crops that, that, that you grew there. And, uh, and then we can go ahead and get started. Well, as you may know, uh, Swift was almost specifically a perennial propagator, a young plant propagator. And so uh, we built that program for 30 years from seed and from the vegetative side of perennials, uh, buying in URCs or doing our own cuttings themselves. And uh, you know, my specialty had always been seed, but then I branched out into that vegetative side. And so it was a lot of digging into culture. And back in the day, you know, when I first came on board, there was no Google. There was no textbooks on perennial propagation. And so we all worked together, we all learned it together, documented everything, and I'll tell you, it was quite a ride. Um, and I've been in this position as product rep now for two years. It was just an opportunity. It was an opportunity I couldn't pass up because I absolutely loved my time at Swift. Love my sweat family. I love the time in the greenhouse. And that is, you know, definitely one thing I miss is my daily greenhouse time, especially, you know, with the current environment of these days. And I'm not traveling like I used to. And so I have more opportunities to do these virtual events with people like you. That's cool. And I think that uh, the information that you're going to share uh, today is definitely going to be extremely helpful to uh to all the growers uh, that, are, that are dealing with uh, all sorts of different conditions right now. So we're here with Ball Tech On Demand. We're gonna help you step up your lavender game specifically. So over the course of this video, Chris is gonna take us through the history of lavender and all the, the different types uh, commonly produced. And then he's gonna drill down into how to select the best type for your specific needs, whether that's the pot size you're growing in, the, the market that you need to hit, um, and then he's going to spend some quality time on production, all the way from seed and URC stages up through to finishing the crop. And he's going to talk about some of the common pitfalls uh, that, that he's encountered over his career in all the different stages, and then close with some variety-specific information, since there have been a ton of new lavender coming to market in recent years. And then he's going to talk a little bit about a grower-friendly scheduling chart that's available from Darwin and Keith. So... I think that sets us up, Chris. If you, unless you have anything to add to that intro, I'm going to let you take the screen and uh, take the wheel. It is all yours. That's great, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great intro. Um, just the thing, you know, it is a challenging time of year right now for propagators. And so we look at uh, getting seed going this time of year. We look at getting URCs going. And so it can be very challenging and so you know be aware we'll uh, address some of those concerns as we go through here um, but yeah i'd like to touch a little bit on the history of lavender and then we'll go into propagation some specifics on how you can have a great lavender program and schedule that as well and have a uh, really great sell through and that's really our point is have a great sell through in our lavender program um because as you know i mean lavender is everywhere and there's just constant breeding in this and Many of them, it can get really muddy. It can get very confusing on what's what out there. How do I use this one? How do I use that one? I'm going to try to clarify some of that for you, uh, you know, and try to make sense of the many varieties that are available, which ones are right for me, which ones are right for my market and my customers, and uh, how do I go about selecting those for the season? Um, and now there's been, you know, tremendous attention to lavender over the years, 
but uh, the National Guard Bureau has declared 2020 to be the year of the lavender, and so there is even more interest put on the lavender this year than any other time. Um, just a brief history of lavenders, just stuff I looked up in books and whatnot, um, has its origins in the Mediterranean, Middle East, and so that's always under uh, important to understand the native um, aspect of lavender, where they originally come from. That's going to help us understand the culture, because even all these hybrids, they're still going to relate back to where are these plants originally native to, that's going to help us uh, with the production side. So originally native to Mediterranean, Middle East area, India as well. Uh, lavender comes from Latin lavar, which means to wash. And so some of the original uses were in baths, you know, for scenting the baths. Uh, but there's just, you know, as it progressed, there's just a tremendous number of uses for lavender. Uh, some of the most interesting I found were the aphrodisiacs. Uh, it was used in mummification. It has insecticidal properties, has medicinal properties, as we all know. You know, it's a very calming effect that's been known to uh, reduce the incidence of headaches and migraines. I don't know. Who knows? It might be worth a try with coronavirus. Who knows? It certainly can't hurt because, you know, lavender has got that pleasing scent. It's been around forever. And it's thought to have been cultivated originally by the Shakers. Uh, before then, it was just, um, you know, uh, gathered natively, um, native growing bushes. They would uh, dry their clothes on the bushes, you know, to get that scent in their clothes as, as well. And so it first came into commercial production by the Shakers in England in mid to late 1700s. And it's obviously progressed there. It began uh, uh, cultivation in the United States, you know, monthly mid 80s or so. And so we have all kinds, but there's two specific separate uh, species of lavenders. We have the English lavender, the Angustifolius. And this would be your traditional, you know, what you commonly refer to as lavender, uh, that sweet lavender scent. Um, there's some of the varieties there, and there's many, many, many more uh, heavy breeding going on in this class. Uh, both seed and vegetative rice good for different uses, um, early spring through fall, depending on what the market is. And the English lavenders are generally the hardy ones. And so, Zone five is zone six, uh, generally cold hardy. And so they also got some great uses as the landscape plant. Next we have the Spanish lavenders, the lavender stocus. Now these are not hardy generally, usually about zone seven hardy. So in the south, you're gonna have them go dormant and come back uh, the following year. But in the north, in, they're going to be you know, mostly like pot crops. But the thing about Spanish lavenders that I really like is they're extremely showy. They've got this pineapple head flower on them with these really colorful flags that stick up. And so that is where a lot of the breeding has been happening on, you know, working on that, that flag color, making sure they're not gonna fade to a brown, make sure they maintain good color on them, um, as well as, you know, exceptional branching and flower count. These are the showiest. These are so good for uh, impulse buys, really. The thing about these, these mostly cool season lavenders. And so most of the Spanish lavenders, they're marketed for early season. In the summer, they generally do not flower. They perform great still, you know, because remember they're native to the Mediterranean. And so we're hot and dry generally. And so they do perform very well in the summer, but they just do not flower, except, you know, later on we'll discuss a new one that does have flowering in the heat and the humidity. So, so for, for folks I, who want to, for folks who want to dry lavender and make sachets and stuff, which one is preferred? Yeah, and see, that is the English lavender. That is your classic, really sweet smell. Um, the Spanish have, you know, more of a pine scent to them. And so I don't personally like the, the Spanish lavender smell as much as I like that English lavender. And then, you know, you mentioned using them as potpourri and sachets and things like that. That is then another use for the lavenders, you know, we've, I, I mostly look at garden use, you know, what's going to perform well in the garden, where am I going to plant it in the garden, how am I going to market it at the grocery store, at the IGC, um, but there is other breeding going on as well to look at that, look at the oil content, uh, looking at the scents of the lavender, and I'll point out uh, one variety that is actually best for that purpose, but most of the breeding is for ornamental value versus uh, cultivation value. 
Now, lavender production, a lot of the newest stuff has been coming from vegetative side. Uh, so the unrooted cuttings, um, they can either be purchased, they can be uh, taken from your own stock, but in general, lavender can be challenging. I've seen, you know, my phone is mostly full of dead crops of uh, really bad looking crops versus the good stuff. And I've taken a lot of pictures of bad lavenders in greenhouses. And um, in general, you know, I just want to go through some basics on the propagation. These are really things that you should be applying to all your unrooted cuttings. Um, number one, use a rooting hormone. Uh, these don't require an exceptionally high rate. It's what I would call an average rate, uh, 500 part per million basal dip, or one of the latest trends has been using the KIBA salts, the potassium IBA salt. And by using this, we can mix it up as a concentrate and we can stick all of our cuttings at once and then we can spray it on top. But it's not just a spray, it's a heavy spray. Now our goal is to get that KIBA down where the tip of that cutting is, just like we'd be doing with the basil dip, but we can do it after the fact. And what this is doing, it's increasing our efficiency in our sticking environments. Instead of having to take each individual cutting and dip it in the powder and then stick the plant, we can stick them all at once and come back and treat the whole area with the KIBA salt. And so I would highly recommend this method uh, for efficiency purposes, and you do need to use that KIBA uh, versus some of the other IBA uh, products that are out there. Uh, some of them can pay, um, contain alcohol or alcohol-based. Those, obviously, you cannot spray on the foliage, and so again, it's a very detrimental effect. And so it is the KIBA, the salt forms, that are used as the drip down spray. So 250 parts per million, high volume on this. It's more like a sprinch, and uh, that's all you really need. And so it has huge effects, great effects. Also, I'm a firm believer in the use of pageant fungicide in propagation. It has been proven to hasten rooting, to strengthen the rooting after they do start. And so it's usually a low rate, four to six ounces per uh, 100 gallons, and it's just a foliar spray, uh, day one or day two after stick. Now, I had this question multiple times, can I mix the pageant with my rooting hormone? Uh, and the answer there is yes. Uh, it is not gonna be detrimental and you will still get the benefits of both of them by combining them together. The only difference is that the pageant only needs to be applied to the foliage. It does not need to go into the soil. And so you can be using more product there. Uh, whereas the IBA needs to go in the soil, the pageant just needs to go on the foliage. But yes, you can combine the two for once again, increasing that efficiency and propagation. And so that's just general good practice as far as URC goes. Next also goes to the media. Now, lavender can be a little more sensitive to a heavy media. And so we gotta be aware of that because that is where most of the problems are gonna occur in propagation. And so I recommend having a very coarse, and you hear well-drained media all the time, okay? But here, it's really critical. What is well-drained media? I would consider this up to, say, 25% perlite. Um, I've always preferred a peat-based media versus a bark-based media for propagation. And by adding 25% perlite, we're gonna get some good wicking away of the moisture around the tip of that cutting. Uh, we need to get a little bit on the dry side, otherwise we're going to have problems like we can see there on the left. And when it does come to perlite, I like to have the medium grade. I don't like the coarse grade, the large chunks. They don't get very evenly distributed in the plug cell, uh, especially when it comes to LA plugs. If you're using LA plugs for propagation, it's too variable as far as the location within there to really get the benefits. And so a smaller grade is beneficial. If you are using LA plugs, try not to compact them. I've seen LA plugs that are just rock hard before and lavender just don't perform the best in there. Try to get those loosened up as much as possible. I always use the loose fill myself. Uh, I love the new grow coons. I think that is great technology and I, I think that is going to gain some traction there. Uh, you kind of get the benefits of both worlds. You get the benefit of the LA plug 
and then it's an individual plug that's easy to pop out of there, transplant, hatch trays, whatever, but you also get the benefit of loose film. Um, and so, yeah, lavenders are very sensitive to moisture. And so when cuttings come in, you gotta understand these have been bounced around. These have been off the plant for two, three, sometimes four days by the time they arrive to you. And so we gotta understand that those cuttings are dehydrated and we need to rehydrate them. They may not actually look wilty, but they are. And so we need to rehydrate them for a couple days by using a medium mist program, whether we're putting those under a boom or whether we're using stationary misters or we're using a fog program. Um, I usually recommend a medium program to get them rehydrated, make sure they're turgid again. But after that, we need to reduce the mist very quickly. Now the goal here is to eliminate any free moisture on the foliage. That's where the problems can occur by having droplets of water there. Um, and that can be exasperated by using salt. Um, I occasionally fed under mist, use fertilizer under mist for some crops, say a salvia numerosa, loves 20, 10, 20 under mist. But for lavender, do not use any fertilizer under mist. Uh, you gotta be aware of your water quality. I've seen some greenhouses that high, have high salts, high sodium in their water. And once again, if you're misting these over misting, you can have those salts accumulating on the foliage, causing tip burns, causing problems. And so what I recommend here is a very fine mist, avoid runoff, dri avoid dripping into the media. And so if that media continues to gain weight and continues to gain moisture, we're gonna have issues. We're gonna have delayed rooting, and the longer these are under mist, the more problems you're gonna have. We need to force those cuttings to send out roots to go look for water. We don't wanna just saturate them, they're just gonna sit there. They're gonna say, I've got all the water I need right here. I'm not gonna send out any roots. We're gonna force them to go out by letting that media dry down just slightly. Um, you know, By day 10, these should be ready for rooting. They should have roots by day 10. Um, if not, that's an indication usually that we're too wet. Um, we want to get them dried down. But another thing, some of the best production and propagation I have seen, even on a large scale, has been using tents. Uh, using a plastic tent, uh, white plastic, over, say, a PVC frame or a conduit frame, and just maintaining high humidity around the cutting. That is where I have seen the absolute best success. And so no chance of getting drip, off, uh, drip from the leaves into the media, no chance that media getting wet. And the media at this one grower that I saw, it was actually starting to turn light brown. It was at about a 3.5 for moisture, if you know the moisture scale, one through five. And he was having just fantastic success. And so critical factor URCs, don't keep them too wet. You're going to have problems. And so after we get these roots, you can give them a pinch. I think that's generally beneficial for most of the vegetatively propagated lavenders is to, after they get going and have a little bit of growth on them, give them a pinch. It increases the branching, get, get branching on them. And, you know, and that's, that's about it for URC. If you watch your moisture, you're doing good. Now for seed, seed for me is a no-brainer. They're pretty easy. Uh, you germinate them warm, you germinate them wet, and you germinate them uncovered. Um, 288 trays, you can, I have direct sown these into 32s before great success. Main thing, once again, keep them wet at the beginning, usually about five days. Uh, An English lavender is going to germinate, or Spanish for that matter, um, from URC, or Spanish from seed. Um, five days, they're going to start germinating, then you start drying them down, and just, you know, normal, good culture there. Main thing is avoid soft growth. In both of these, you know, URC or seed, avoid soft growth using fertilizers such as 201020. Um, those are really bad for uh, lavenders. Get them too soft. They are susceptible to botrytis. They are susceptible to fusarium, rhizoctonia, and propagation. So maintain a nice toned plant with a calcium magnesium type fertilizer, 15.5, 15, 14.4, 15, 14, 14. A couple of my favorites in prop. And then for the seedlings, of course, transplant them on time. You don't want those to get root bound before they're ready to go into their final containers. So final containers are finishing our lavenders. Um, really not very challenging if you're aware of a few things. Once again, they're susceptible to botrytis and fusarium. 
And so preventative sprays are really good there. Uh, personally, I love the strobilarin fungicides for um, fusarium. Pageant, once again, excellent all around for uh, fungicide for uh, a multitude of diseases. Keep the foliage dry. You know, you're gonna solve most of your problems by keeping the foliage dry, keeping the media right in the middle. You know, you need to water them from a two to a four, avoid the extremes, you're gonna avoid a lot of the problems. Um, good airflow, of course, especially, you know, if you're producing these early season in a greenhouse, uh, a double poly greenhouse, say here in the Midwest that I'm used to, can be very challenging if we're growing these say March and April. We can have a lot of cloudy days, we can have a lot of high humidity, and so those are challenging conditions, and that's all the more reason to make sure you have nice toned growth, avoiding that ammonia, avoiding the phosphorus. If you're able to grow them outdoors in southern climates, that is ideal. They love high lights, and so in the Midwest, Great Lakes area, if you have a, a stretch of clouds, Supplemental lighting is definitely beneficial. But then if we are starting to get a little bit out of hand, we can always come back, we can trim them again in the finished container, not a problem, but we gotta understand we're gonna delay the flowering considerably by doing that, especially if they're at the stage here where they're already budded. Uh, we can also use a little bit of PGR. Now lavenders, I suppose you can eat them if you want, but generally they're not a, a food crop. And so we're able to use B9 on these uh, 2,500 parts, it's usually plenty. Uh, they're very responsive to B9, so do not apply it too early though. We can uh, stunt them a little bit, we can delay flowering, uh, but if need be, B9 can be used. As far as temperatures go, Spanish lavenders, they need to be grown cool. We grow Spanish lavender very warm. They're generally gonna be very delayed in flowering. They're not going to flower. You're not gonna get the nicest growth habit out of Spanish. They like to be grown 50, 55 degrees. You can go a little bit cooler at night. We grow them slow and cool for the absolute best Spanish lavenders. For the English, generally, they're the warm season lavenders. So above 60 degrees. Um, a couple years ago at CAST, we had some lavenders growing in our Santa Paula facility outdoors under a hoop house. And it had been a very cool season. And the English lavenders, they, were, they went dormant. So now they were in suspended animation. The Spanish were growing beautifully, but the English, you know, kind of got this grayish green color to them, no active growth, it was just too cool. So English, a little more difficult to grow outdoors early season, but ideal for summertime. So choosing the right variety, like I said, there's lots to choose from. And so what is our market? What are we gonna be growing these in and who are we gonna be selling them to? Who's gonna be looking at them at retail? And so, all different sizes of containers. There's a lavender for everything. Quartz, even, you know, we can go down even smaller than that. We can go into three inch programs. We can go into mini programs. Um, the Blue Sphere, ideal for mini programs there. But then we can go into fancy decos, urn bowls, you name it. There's a lavender for all of it. Main thing is, is to be aware of those larger containers, those deco pots where we really want to make a statement you can't choose a variety that's going to be too small. That's going to be too dwarf and really not fill that out well. Um, otherwise, yeah, we can put any of these into quart containers, um, but uh, certainly things like the Anook are ideal for the large containers, the Super Blue. Um, also, we'll talk about a brand new one, Primavera, that has a lot of potential for virtually any market and any size container. And so when it comes to our markets and it comes to our customers and we're looking at our entire season. And what I like to do is, you know, we often stagger our crops, you know, every two weeks you plant the same crop, have it come in fresh for market then. I like to do something similar with lavender, but I have such a selection, instead of just planting another crop of the same one, I can change varieties. And I can step it up and have it new and fresh for my customer that way as well as staggering the same crops if I choose to. And so we're gonna transition through the varieties throughout the season by using uh, different ones that are gonna be suitable for my market and suitable for the environment at the time. And so we need to choose the correct variety for those cool season, the early in the, in the greenhouse, mostly production. We need to choose right variety for say June and July, mid season growing, because we're gonna get very hot then. Not all varieties are gonna be suitable for that environment. And then 
We can also look at a lavender for a fall program. I think that's a great use for some of these lavenders. I see more and more potential in fall programs. Now, as I mentioned before, most of the breeding has been going towards the ornamental side, but I had to make mention of the oil content and harvesting the oils and extraction of the oils. Lavender Grosso, I have learned, is the highest oil content lavender that there is. So if you're looking to produce oils or things like that for uh, sachets or whatever, granted, all of the lavenders smell really good, smell really strong, but this one is going to have the highest oil content. And so to my knowledge, there's not been a lot of breeding going on as far as that use of lavenders, but I'm not that on top of uh, the uh, production side like that. I'm on the ornamental side of the lavenders. Hey, and so Chris, let's, so discuss, we'll go through. When I look at lavender trends at retail, I, I feel like it's seeing a trend toward the smaller quartz earlier in the season. Um, and then the larger specimens in the summer and then fall tends to be gallons and, and, and sort of maybe larger sizes. What, what are you seeing in terms of trends at retail when it comes to sizes and maybe even, you know, different formats that these are being sold in? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to the small containers early on because we can look at what customers are looking to use them for. Um, odds are they're wanting to plant them in the garden at that time. And so they want to watch them grow and develop throughout the season. Uh, but then again, early in the spring also, we could be looking for a high impact uh, impulse buy, say for an Easter promotion or something like that. And so we can see a larger container. That's where I see the Spanish lavenders being used more because they've got that high impact at retail for early season. And so I could see them in larger containers there. And then for the fall, of course, we're looking at fall decoration. And so, yeah, we're looking at leaving them in the container. Generally, most people are not gonna be planting them in the ground that time of year. And so, yeah, I do see more smaller containers ready for the garden early in the season, and then the larger containers for summer production and fall sales. Okay, so we want to go into our season starters. And when does our season start? It's gonna depend on where you are. Uh, so if we're in California, Texas, Florida, our season's gonna be starting in February. Now in the North, we're looking at more, maybe late March into April is gonna be our season starters. But for that season start, we're gonna be looking at lower light levels sometimes, you know, depending on where you are, but the day length is gonna be shorter. So that's one thing that we need to consider for flowering, a shorter photo period. We also need to consider going to be cooler. Uh, cool nights, especially as I mentioned in California, coming on early blue is the earliest flowering of the English lavenders. Only it's a 10 hour photo period for flowering. So that's essentially just about any time. But the thing about this one is it flowers and it grows and it bulks up in those cool temperatures. Uh, that example from uh, Santa Paula at our facility, all the English lavender, we're going dormant except for this one. This one had bright green, fresh growth on it. It really stood out. Um, and so this is our season starter. We're gonna uh, have this one ready for market in February in California. We're gonna start season in March in the Midwest and Great Lakes with this one. Very easy to grow. You know, once again, it's a seed item. It's a no-brainer to grow. You can trim it in the plug tray. You can tr trim it right after you transplant. Um, but be aware, you know, this is our early season. This is a cool season lavender. This is not going to be as suitable for later in the season. And a particular note, this one is zone six hardy. So many of the English lavenders are zone five hardy. This one's zone six. Also early, we want to look at Spanish lavenders. And so generally Spanish are marketed early. Bandera from seed, first year flowering. Many of the Spanish lavenders need a cool treatment to flower fully uh, for spring. This one does not being grown from seed. And so this one, this whole series here is absolutely amazing on the heavily branched plants that you get. And it gets so many flowers, it almost completely covers the foliage. Um, absolutely knockout for those impulse by that bright blast of color in the springtime. Um, compact, eight to 10 inches. Looks great in containers, looks great in a little deco bowl. But uh, one idea I have, and I have yet to see it, 
it was when I saw all these together in a display, I was like, why don't we take three of those and put them in a larger bowl together as a trio? I think that just looked fantastic. The deep rose, the deep purple, and the pink, I think would just make an outstanding display in a mixed bowl. And so Spanish lavender, early season. Here we have our English. Here we have our Spanish for early season. Great seed opportunities there. But then we also have our vegetative Spanish lavender. The Nook series has been around for a while. It is probably one of the most popular of the Spanish lavenders. It is vegetative, and so we use all those good uh, protocols as far as getting the URCs to root here. But uh, like I mentioned before, Spanish lavender is very showy novelties. Um, do great in deco pots, different colored pots, uh, ceramic pots. Absolutely love these. And as I mentioned, the Inooks do require a cool treatment for full flowering. And so for scheduling these, if you're starting with URCs, you're going to be wanting to buy these in the fall. We're looking at you know, week 36, week 40 maybe. We're going to be growing them up. We're going to be transplanting them in the containers. Then we're going to be cold treating them. We'll consider that below 50 degrees for up to eight weeks. And that's what these are going to need for full flowering. But then we grow them cool. And it's absolutely one of the showiest lavenders, uh, Spanish lavenders there is. And once again, we're looking at early sales. Our market is going to be a little bit later than the Bandera because this is vegetative and it needs the cool treatment. And so to get that cool treatment, we're looking at March sales versus the February sales down south. In the north, we're looking at a little bit later, April to May. And I think everybody probably knows the Anook variety if you know the, the lavender trees. They've become very popular over the last few years and that is a uh, lavender or nook that is being used for those lavender standards. But once again, we're looking at early season only. When it turns really hot, these are going to stop flowering. They're still going to perform great, but they're going to not uh, go out of flower. And so as our season progresses, temperatures are getting warmer, days are getting longer. Those other ones are not going to perform as well. Having on early blue, the Spanish lavender is not going to perform as well. We're going to transition now to lavender elegance. Now, this one's going to perform better in the heat. Still a short day flowering, but we have uh, warmer temperatures now. We need to switch varieties. We have our classic purple, of course, but we have other novelty colors that have been award winning over the years. And so, kind of a unique, you know, something different for a lavender. Personally, I still prefer. That purple, the classic purple lavender, you know, but the pink is is really nice, and so is the the sky, the ice, um, really nice as far as some unique items. Um, we're buying these in as plugs, you know, say a 288 plug. We're going to look at 10 to 12 weeks to finish, but I'll go into a lot more detail on the weeks to finish here in a little bit. And so these are going to be your lavender to use, your English lavender up through say May and June. Uh, May and June sales. Blue Spirit will fit in that same window as well. This one's different in that it is more compact than the Elegance series. And I've been told that container there on the left is a single plant. Uh, the branching on Blue Spirit is just absolutely incredible. And so this is one of the showiest of the lavenders, especially from seed. Very large flower. And what I like about this too is the very upright habit of it. Uh, the, the stems aren't kind of laying over to the side of that pot. And so it gives a really good presentation. Um, being the size this is, I like this one in many programs. I was uh, talking with the salesperson, it was last summer, we discussed a miniature program for a grocery store. And they were gonna stick these in two and a half inch pots. And I can see on, on like a vertical display or an angled display at retail in flower, such as that container on the lower right. I can't tell you exactly what size that is, but look at the plant, it's a pretty small container, and it's just a really cute display. And so lavender blue spear, this one does require long days, and so we're looking at 11, 12 weeks to finish with the proper temperatures. Once again, English lavender likes to be grown warm in general, but we're also looking at a 14-hour photo period. And so this is not going to flower on its own early in the season. We can certainly get flower out of season with supplemental lighting or night interruption lighting as necessary. 
And then as our season progresses even more, we're gonna want to transition to more heat tolerant varieties. Super Blue fits that, uh, that scheme very well. This can be done early in the season as well. This does not require long days. It is facultative long days, meaning long days will help it flower faster, but it does not have to have them. But uh, Super Blue has been one of the most popular vegetative varieties. The, the intense blue color uh, is just extremely showy. Uh, Richard Hockey at the Chicago Botanic Gardens just last year finished a seven year trial on lavenders comparing, I can't remember how many varieties he had. And Super Blue came out as a top performer, both for its flower power and its overwintering capability. So a good solid zone five overwintering lavender. Um, great, uh, great presentation in the garden and really easy to produce for finished containers. Uh, and so for summer, you know, generally lavenders can be rather challenging to finish for an August market. But then again, I don't see a lot of things hitting the garden center in August, maybe not until late August. And so we're talking mid season, I'm talking late August, you know, we're talking into September then. Uh, and that's where we're going to be targeting these. Very simple to grow. We want to do them for spring, 10 weeks for fall. We have that heat and humidity of summer, eight weeks to finish. Um, the smell on this one is just absolutely incredible, too. And then a couple more mid to late season English lavenders. The Levant Steep Purple, that picture on the left there, that is a program I set up for a grower in Michigan last year. And uh, that was week 36 sales, just absolutely outstanding. That was a, a BHG program they did. Thing about these uh, late summer bloomers uh, for the late summer markets, you can tell by these, the habit of these is more open than the blue spear. The blue spear, the intense ranching there, very tight canopy, it's not gonna perform well in the heat. It's gonna get all the humidity, it's gonna get the moisture in there, and it's gonna melt out. These have a more open habit, which is what makes them more suitable for that summer production. Uh, from the vegetative side, lavender and net. It's a very tough, very sturdy lavender. And what I like about this, it has very stiff stems. And so this was originally selected for shipping, to not break during shipping, but uh, it's been coming up with all kinds of other outstanding properties as well. So that's definitely one to take a look at, but it is definitely uh, a fall item there because this does not flower in the springtime. Uh, it's very difficult, a late bloomer. And so this is definitely for fall markets. And as I mentioned before, and kind of alluded to before, we now have a lavender, a Spanish lavender for all seasons. Uh, it's called Lavender Primavera. And this is truly a game changing Spanish lavender. And that's primarily, number one, it does not require any chill to flower. Now we have the seed variety before, of course, we can do it from seed, we have first year flowering there, but this is a vegetative variety that does not require any cooling. And so it's essentially can be grown like an annual. And so with it not needing any chill, we can have it flowering any time of year. Uh, the person, the, the breeder in the Netherlands who originally selected this one had it called uh, Salcon Winter because he saw this flowering in December and thought that was extremely unusual. And that's how it came to market as Primavera now. Uh, also of interest in this one is that, or as I mentioned before, all Spanish lavenders, they go out of bloom in the summertime, not this one. This one flowers in the summer as well. Picture on the left there, mid-August of a couple of years ago, planted in May, no cold treatments, went through the summer, and it's got that great flower power. That is very unusual. Uh, you do not see that in any other Spanish lavenders. On the right-hand side, that was a Metrolina trial, North Carolina, planted outside week 16, photo November, uh, July 2nd. It had been, I was told, highs in the 80s. They had been having flooding rains, and it was just outstanding performer. Um, definitely, uh, we've got high hopes for this one. This one is going to hit all kinds of markets. This can be used for all kinds of containers as well. And so we're looking at, you know, very easily Valentine's program. Had one customer inquire about Christmas. Why not have a Spanish lavender program for Christmas? 
uh, very interesting, the different things that people are thinking about using this one for. And so I think it's really going to be a game changer. We're looking at indoors, um, how much lights do these actually need for indoors. Um, and if we bring it in for outdoors or we buy it at the supermarket, how long is it gonna last in my kitchen? Not necessarily sitting directly in a window, but on my kitchen island. Um, and that's one thing we're looking at with this one. And the picture there on the left, I just took that about an hour ago out front of my house. Um, it was very bright light right now, so the picture's kind of washed out, but there's flowers coming on that still. There's uh, another amazing thing about this is as the flowers do age, they maintain their color. They don't turn brown. They fade, but they don't turn brown. But I've still got new flowers coming there. We've been in the 90s for the last two weeks straight. It's uh, going up to 93 again today, and this lavender is still going. It's absolutely amazing. And so uh, opens up a whole new window for the possibilities of lavender. And to simplify things for a little bit, like I said, it can get very muddy out there on how I'm gonna use these different lavenders, when. And so made up a simple chart that's going to help you figure that out. Uh, there's the, the months of the year where I can market them for different regions of the country and a rough weeks to finish. As I mentioned before, a couple of them, you know, like the blue sphere, um, the super blue, these are gonna have a photo period requirement attached to them. So if we want them very early, we need to have supplemental lighting, long day lighting going on those. Um, all of them though, they're gonna be directly related to temperature. And so the warmer we're growing them, the faster they're gonna come into flower. And so once again, early spring in the greenhouse can be challenging times. I would probably include any of my lavenders in production along with my annuals versus growing perennials. Most people are gonna grow perennials cooler. I would probably put my lavenders in with the annuals. And so we can get those warm temperatures and get them to come in flower faster, except for those fans, which still like the 50 to 55 degrees. And so a great chart here for you to look at and for you to utilize yourself in your production in making sense of all the lavender genetics that are available to you and the different ways that we can use them. It's, it's truly, it's very exciting. Um, the products they have made it to market and the, the new and uh, exciting ways people are using lavender, not just for the scents and the potpourris, uh, but also different ways to using them in the gardens and for decorating. And I think that's all I have to share with you right now, Bill, unless you've got any questions and I need some clarifications on Anything that I missed? No, I mean, I, I think that you really did share a lot of fantastic information. I will ask the viewers to do Chris a favor and try the Bandera Trio. I think that that, I mean, I, I, I know at retail, whenever you mix up the colors within the same variety, it, it tends to be a, to be a hit. So I, I think that I could see that in a bowl or a, a decent sized patio container. I think that that would look really cool. Yeah. I also, uh, I mean, I, I agree. I think that Super Blue really is a rock star. I mean, that that is such a, a fantastic plant. I've had it in my garden. It's absolutely uh, awesome. And then just the thought of Primavera opening up all these different options throughout yes. the season. Um, I, I'm really excited to see that one. And I think that you're going to see that added to a lot of growers mixes um, and available uh, quite a bit uh, next year. So that, that's going to be a fun one to watch kind of take off. So. Yeah. And on that Primavera, we had uh, our discussions within the, the Darwin Perennials team. And next year, we're going to have a mixed container competition amongst us because the whole team has Primavera at their homes now. Uh, I brought home so much that all of my neighbors have it as well. And so uh, we're going to have next year a mixed container competition with our Darwin Perennials team on who is going to put this together with a cucumber, with a lismachia, maybe a grass in there as well to come up with the best combination for the primaveras. That's cool. And it's fun. And it brings fragrance into a mixed combo. I mean, I, I just see so many different opportunities with lavender. I'm a lavender fan. Like I've always liked lavender. I know my mom always had lavender in the garden when I was a kid. Um, 
lavender helped my kids sleep when they were little. I, I just have a big fan of lavender. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's really fun to see all the, this new breeding. It's truly uh, a crop that continues to evolve. Um, no, I think you gave us so much great information. I really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through uh, this crop. Um, like Chris said, 2020 is the year of the lavender, according to National Garden Bureau. So you're going to get some built-in promotion from a, a garden communicator's perspective. Um, and this really is going to be, I do think, a, a big year, even this fall um, coming up. And I thought the history lesson was fascinating. It, it, was, it was interesting to see how lavender has been used uh, throughout history. And then obviously clarifying the positioning of the different types, I think, is, is, is very helpful um, to everybody because, uh, like you said, there are different types for different uses, different climates and, and conditions. Um, your experience with lavender is, is top notch. And I can tell from some of the pitfalls uh, that, that you shared, um, you know, specifically the moisture and, and mist challenges. I can tell you're kind of speaking maybe. From it, it's always a that. learning experience. We're, <laughs> we're constantly learning on this one in particular. Yes. So I, I, it's great. You definitely uh, have, have walked the walk on this on this crop. So again, Chris, I, I really do appreciate it. Very welcome, Bill, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, on behalf of Tech on Demand and the the Darwin Perennials team, the Keith Seed team, uh, I'm Bill Calkins with Ball Tech on Demand, and I definitely want to thank you for joining us in this discussion. Um, but real quick before we go, I do want to give a quick shout out to the Greenhouse Tech Team closed group on Facebook. I know, Chris, you're a member and uh, definitely are, are in there answering a lot of perennial questions. Um, there's more than a thousand greenhouse professionals in this group uh, engaged in daily discussions about growing annuals, perennials, tropical plants, seasonal crops, vegetables, and, and, and even more. So if you post questions in this group as a grower, you're pretty much guaranteed to get answers or input very quickly. Um, we see many, many answers coming uh, even within the first couple hours. Uh, we have more than 20 crop specific topics, uh, including perennials that you can jump right into and, uh, and share your experiences and, and engage with those conversations. So all you need to do to join, it's very simple. You search Greenhouse Tech Team on Facebook. Um, you'll get a couple questions just sort of validating that you're a greenhouse professional and then we'll welcome you in. So again, uh, thank you so much for, for listening to this deep dive into lavender and uh, that's it for now. But uh, Ball Tech On Demand is going to be back with uh, more content to help you grow all the best and nothing else.